Hello, and greetings from Montreal, Canada. My name is Dr. Ken Beatty, and I'm a TESOL professor. It means that I work with teachers, uh, and my teachers are studying for master's degrees and doctoral degrees. Uh, so I'm trying to help them become better teachers in many ways. Um, but before that, I taught for 12 years in Hong Kong. Uh, when I was teaching there, I was working in a program called English for Professional Communication at City University of Hong Kong. Now, the key word there was professional. All of my students were looking for jobs. They were hoping to use their language skills and other skills such as computer design that they were picking up to communicate better in the workplace and through that to get better jobs. So I'm deeply interested in the topic of today's webinar, which is employability, new jobs, new needs for language learners. We can start off our talk with looking at the photograph on the right uh, of the screen here. I've chosen this for a very ironic kind of a reason. It says it's something that when I started teaching, it would have been completely uh, incomprehensible to me. Why? Why? What's so strange about this? We look at the picture and we see something that we see every day across every city in the world. We see somebody working at their laptop, probably in a coffee shop setting, uh, and uh, that's, that's a normal job these days. But I, was, uh, I started teaching one year before the introduction of the uh, personal uh, computer. And it was many years before the introduction of the laptop and even more years before the introduction of the internet and the ability to work uh, remotely. So things change and that's part of the theme of today is things continue to change over time. And as teachers, one of the biggest challenges that we face working with language learners is to adapt to change. Uh, so what's the changing nature of work exactly? And what skills do today's students need to be successful? Well, again, I'm going to reach backwards and, and look into my own particular history about my own family. And one of my grandfathers worked as a whaler. He hunted whales. Completely politically incorrect <laughs> job these days, of course. Nobody wants to do that. And of course, all of the things that they hunted whales for, their, uh, their oil and such especially, you know, is no longer an important product. And so that really saved the whales more than anything else. Uh, then he worked as a farmer. But what's, what, what did he need? What did he need in terms of employability skills? What did he need in terms of language skills to do such a job? Well, his employability skill, there was just one. It was his strength, you know. He had to be strong uh, to work on a boat. And he had to learn all the technical aspects of whaling, uh, words like harpoon, everything else, and the language skills other language skills, he had to learn all of those things on the job. So he was hired, learned on the job. What about my father? At 16, my father dropped out of school, not uncommon for uh, his time, and he left work to work at a bank, left school to work at a bank. Uh, then uh, as he got a little older, he moved to Vancouver and he worked uh, on the docks. He was a longshoreman. And uh, after that, many years, he became an accountant. And so uh, he was an accountant for the last 25 years of his life, and he, he did a great job of that. He was very good with numbers. He was always very good at numbers, but for all of these different jobs, it was also a case of learning on the job. His employability skills, yeah, a little bit from school about numbers, but otherwise, otherwise everything he had to do, he learned on the job. How about me? I teach teachers and I write books. Um, I've written 76 books for Pearson. And so uh, how did I learn those things? Well, like many of you, I trained to become a school teacher. I went to university to do that. Um, and I learned to write textbooks though on a job, thanks to many, many wonderful editors who were very patient with my stupidity. Uh, they, uh, they trained me and taught me what to do and what could work and what wouldn't work. And over time, I became better and better at my job as a textbook writer, something I continue to do today. So what about my sons going to the next generation? These are my sons, my two sons, they're older now. Uh, my sons work in business and in computing. So they studied international economics and computing at university. They both got bachelor degrees and they didn't learn employability skills. 
Uh, they didn't learn any language skills uh, specific to the workplace. I asked them about this and say, no, there was nothing really in any of their courses to sort of prepare them for the world of work, even though that's obviously where they were going after university. So based on this idea of so many people and so many generations even learning on the job, why do we need to teach today's language students employability skills? And why is it specific to language students? Well, there's a number of different reasons and we're gonna visit some of them throughout here, but I just wanna foreground a few. First of all, second language learners are often vulnerable in the target language environment, just in general. It's, uh, by vulnerable, I mean it's easy to, for them to be taken advantage of in some cases, to miss out in benefits and, and, and opportunities in other situations, simply because they do not have the language skills to cope. When students leave our classroom, it would be great if they learned English perf had learned English perfectly and there was never going to be a problem, but that's not the case. We are all language learners. I am a native speaker of English, but I consider myself still to be a language learner. Why? Because I keep learning new aspects of language. I learn new vocabulary every day. I read new genres of books and comics and everything else. Uh, so I have, to, I have to have an alert mind and I have to be open. I need tools to continue learning. And so do our students. Um, and the third point is in academia and throughout the school situation in school and university and in the workplace, these skills uh, are the ones that remain human. Uh, what do I mean remain human? Well, uh, we're going to talk a little bit later about where jobs are going. And increasingly what we see is the things that make us uniquely human, those, those thinking skills, those social skills, those are the ones uh, for the jobs of the future. So let's explore a bit more. We'll start with these two questions. We have to get some definitions down so we're talking on the same page. The first one is, what does employability mean? And secondly, how is employability tied to teaching and learning English? So two key things. Okay, for the first one, we've got a definition from York, um, 2004, who defines it as a set of achievements, skills, understandings, and personal attributes that make graduates more likely to gain employment. So it means that they're more likely to be able to get a job. So what are those things? Skills. Skills, certainly, you know, my son's learning computer science and uh, international economics have helped them with their careers, but also understandings of how the workplace works, what employer, employers are looking for, you know, how to interact with other people, and personal at attributes. One of them is confidence. Confidence. It's, you think, well, we don't really have courses in confidence at our school, but we do. And that's one of the great things we do in the language classroom is we build up students' confidence. We build up their motivation. We build up their interest and excitement about learning. And those are things that make good, you know, students, but also make good workers. The second part of this quote really talks about something else. It, these employability skills benefit the students, certainly, uh, but it also the workforce, the community, and the economy. And for most of us who work in public education, uh, uh, funded by the government uh, in many cases, our concern is to make you know, our students better, our university or college or school better, to make our city better, to make our country better, to make the world better. We're really doing that one student at a time, improving things. So it's something we can think about. But what is the nature of work today? And how is it changing? We've already seen some examples from my grandfather's day, you know, to how, you know, what's, what students are doing now and what they're more likely to be doing. Uh, certain things have forced changes upon us. And one is that, you know, since the 1760 with the Industrial Revolution, machines have reduced the need for workers. It's led to factories, but even in areas like farming, uh, the picture you see here of tasseling corn, taking the little fur tufts off uh, uh, rows of corn to improve the yield. It really, it's really something that, uh, something that a thousand workers would have done in a field this size at one time. But now, of course, uh, you can see there's six, seven uh, machines just rolling down, doing the work of a thousand people. So things have changed because of machines. 
Robots are increasingly replacing workers in factories. It's something that's extremely common. Why? Why are, why are so many robots in factories? It's purely economic, purely economic. Why? Let's look at the price tags. It costs for one of these robot arms about $80,000 US. So for that price, for that price, that robot is working 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It's going to work for years. It doesn't require any housing, any sick leave, any dental benefits, no retirement. It just keeps doing its job. It's never gonna go on strike. It's never gonna complain about the work. It just uh, is, is kind of, as an economic decision, it just trumps human beings in the workplace. Of course, there's still many, many factories that employ people. We have them all around the world, but I do say that it's changing and anywhere where a factory owner can replace human beings with uh, robotics, I think they're going to. There's other new technologies which end up eliminating jobs sometimes in surprising ways. Uh, most of us have used uh, some kind of a uh, ATM machine to get some cash out. And uh, according to uh, Zahaldi from the uh, World Economic Forum, the bank clerk is the fastest declining job. If you're looking for a job as a bank clerk, it is the one most likely to end, to, go, to, to be exterminated by technology. But it's not just because of the ATM machines. It's because I can go into a store and pay with my watch. I can just click my watch or my phone onto the little e-reader and I, I don't actually have have any cash in my wallet right now. I don't need it. I just walk around without it and use my cards everywhere that I shop. So you can see things are changing there. It's an unexpected uh, consequence of the new technology. There are, however, new jobs emerging and uh, uh, in, the, in the area. Again, this is uh, uh, Zahidi from the World Economic Forum summarizing some of these. These are the top seven coming. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning specialists, uh, sustainability sus specialists, uh, business and intelligence analysts, information security analysts, fintech engineers, uh, data analysts and scientists, and robotics engineers. No surprise there with the last one. All of these, uh, interestingly, have large language components to them, which I find very inspiring and, and hopeful as a language teacher. So that's the future that's coming. Many small changes are positive uh, as these things are happening. Uh, one of them are is uh, work from home opportunities, uh, which allow many to have a better work-life balance with less commuting. And this has really been one of the outcomes of the COVID uh, time of COVID, is that really so many people had to work at home. Suddenly they found they could work at home, and uh, it's actually something that I've been doing, uh, teaching uh, my graduate students and doctoral students for the last 14 years. I teach remotely. Of course, I travel to visit them and meet them in in. In, uh, in uh, residential sessions once in a while, but, uh, but most of my work is done online, like today's webinar. But changing the nature of work means learning new employability and language skills. I had to learn, you know, using the computer, how to make it work, basically for online teaching and learning. It's a different thing. Um, but some are not ready for employment. Um, and this is something, an article from the Harvard Business Review, and it said that many new to the workforce employees are struggling. Uh, 51% of Generation Z employees, that's the students who were born between 1990 and 2010, they say that their education has not prepared them to enter the workforce. So they're struggling a little bit. And if they're struggling as native speakers, what are the rest of our language students doing? So it begs the question, what new language and employability skills do students need for the modern workplace? It's a big question and one that uh, fortunately Pearson has spent an incredible amount of research time uh, trying to explore. And they've come up with these seven uh, points. Uh, the first one is critical thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration, self-management, leadership, 
and social responsibility. So these seven points are actually ones, again, it's not taken from the world of education. It's really reaching out uh, and contacting employers and uh, employment organizations and government organizations and finding out what are the most important things that students need to learn. Because of course, Pearson as a publisher wants to translate those ideas into their teaching and learning materials. And again, again, the great thing is, is that these are mostly language skills. Critical thinking, you got to talk about it, right? Creativity, you have ideas, you're sharing them, exploring them together. Communication, goes without saying. Collaboration, you're working with other people. You're either speaking in person or you're writing uh, to someone else. Self-management is about organizing your ideas, your environment, your personal time uh, to be more effective. And and a lot of those have language components as well. Leadership, you're talking to teams. That's if you have leadership uh, positions. And social responsibility is an interesting one. It's kind of looking at how should you behave in the world and what social issues should be important to you. And again, a lot of that comes through talking. So again, we can look at all of these skills as language skills. I'd like to go through each of these uh, with examples. And as I go through them with these examples, um, I'd like to talk about these three resources today. Um, the first is Speak Out, it's a textbook, and I'm gonna use some examples from this one. The second one is Step Up, and the third is a digital resource across the entire Pearson uh, uh, library of titles now. And it's, it's a, digital, uh, uh, a digital English uh, Connect that is being used, Pearson Connect, which is used to uh, do many of the things that our other digital resources did in the past. So I'm using these as examples, but it doesn't mean that the talk is restricted to them. In fact, as examples, really, what I'm looking for you to do is take the principles What's the general idea, the general principle? So if you're using other books, even from other publishers, it doesn't matter. Uh, the principles are going to be the same. So you can apply them in whatever way you see fit. Let's start off with this first one though, critical thinking. Uh, this is the first of the seven skills. Uh, critical thinking is really about logically considering problems and, and information available to you to better understand something. So that's what re really critical thinking is all about. And I he have the photo here of a maze. So you can imagine yourself in a maze, critical thinking, you're gonna try to find your way out of the maze. How are you going to do that? You have gonna have some ideas. I've heard this before, but evidently if you turn left in a maze, like always, always, always turn left, then eventually you'll come out of the maze. Um, I, I don't know if that's true. I, I, and I imagine maze designers are probably working against that, but that's one idea. Okay, so, uh, so that's critical thinking. Um, how do we teach critical thinking though becomes a question for us. Critical thinking is a series of strategies and skills. Strategies and skills, what's the difference, right? Okay, there's a big difference. Even though they're often used in the same breath or interchangeably, really they are different. And this is the difference. Strategies are conscious attempts. You're thinking about how do I solve this problem? Skills are unconscious practices when you no longer think about it. Now, two young boys, uh, uh, when my sons were very little, I remember one time uh, our uh, oldest son had gotten a new pair of shoes, new pair of little running shoes, right? And he was also at that age where he was starting to dress himself. So what did he do? I go upstairs and he's struggling, why? Because first he put on his shoes, and then he was trying to put on his pants. <laughs> okay, so you can imagine that didn't really work. Uh, all right, so what's the problem here? Okay, you first, you, there's a way of doing it. You have to have a strategy. Put on your pants first, then put on your shoes afterwards. You don't think about that each morning. When you get up, get out of bed, you look at your clothes, you don't think, oh, should I put on my shoes or should I put on my pants first? You've figured it out, you've done it, and so it has become a skill. 
dressing yourself has become a skill and you no longer think about how you have to do it. So this is really what it's about. Learning strategies uh, in the classroom help, uh, sets learners up for lifelong learning. It's a really important thing that we do, is teaching them many different strategies for problem solving and especially for critical thinking. How do they learn these exactly? Well, students acquire strategies in three ways. Um, first of all, uh, you know, observation. So if my son watches me putting on my clothes and sees me put on my pants and then my shoes, he's observed it and so maybe he'll remember that and he thinks that way. Uh, the second way, instruction, of course, I say, okay, now we're going to get dressed. What do we put on first? Let's put on our pants first, right? Okay. And so the instruction helps them along. And the third one is problem solving, which, of course, is what my son was doing that morning. He was trying to solve the problem himself and probably realized that you can't put your shoes on first. You have to put on your pants first. So, uh, you know, so you, uh, critical thinking comes out of all of those. All right, he's figured it out in some way. Um, for us, in the classroom, we have to use these same things. We have to create opportunities for observation, we need to give instruction, and we just need to set tasks or problems that the students can, fall, uh, can try to solve on their own. And through that, they'll learn the lessons that are necessary, and more importantly, they'll learn language to solve those problems as well, especially if they're working with someone else. So here's an example from one of the books and a very straightforward, simple question. Look at the photo. Do you feel more comfortable networking in person or online? So an interesting question, in person or online? How do you prefer to work? So in this case, in this case, looking at the photo, you're, you, start, uh, you start by asking a series of who, what, when, where, why, and how questions. These questions help you to figure out, you know, what exactly is going on and to make some guesses, make some guesses about what is going on and then, you know, test those guesses or hypotheses uh, with another student because you're going to discuss this in pairs. So you look at it and you say, okay, well, I see two people here. One's older, maybe more experienced. So for networking, you want to network with somebody who's more experienced. Um, I also noticed something else important here. The young woman is taking notes. And so where are they? Maybe in a library or some other office situation. And she's taking notes. So that's an important part of this is, is in the learning process. That is a strategy for remembering. So through this, through this activity, students are consciously, of course, just trying to answer the question, but unconsciously, they're learning other things which may not be, you know, immediately apparent to them. Critical thinking, uh, one thing we want to do is ask students to share their learning strategies. How do you learn? How do you study? How do you take notes? You know, tell the other students, share those things. Why do we do this? It's because students are often better at listening to their peers, listening to other students for advice than listening to the teacher for advice. It's the same, it's the same if you have kids. I, I you know what I mean. You know, my, my sons, you know, believe me or listen to me. Never, you know, uh, listen to their friends or to, you know, uh, friends' fathers even. Yes, of course, you know. So it's, it's interesting how they, uh, how they just like to listen to other peers for information. Um, what about creative thinking? This is the second of the seven steps. And uh, cre creative thinking is about developing new and useful ideas, often by rethinking a problem. So in the critical thinking one with the maze, all we think about is, okay, how do we get out of the maze following the path, doing this and that? But for creative thinking, you might redefine the problem and say, really my problem is how to understand the maze. Understand, you know, how big it is, where it goes, where the paths are, and maybe the solution is just putting a ladder up or stand on my shoulders, you can look over, or I have a selfie stick, you know, look over <laughs> like that, and then you would get a better idea. It, it depends whether or not you're redefining the problem or rethinking the problem in some new way. So that's creative thinking, but how do we teach that?
How do we teach creative thinking? A lot of traditional uh, teaching and learning is about questions and answers where the teacher or the book knows the answers and the students have to listen and read to memorize. Uh, it's, it's a little bit boring. It's a little bit boring. Why? Because we ask questions that maybe everybody knows or doesn't know, but only one student puts up their hand. What's the biggest city in Quebec? Uh, one student puts up their hand, Montreal. It's a boring question. The other ones either know it or don't know, but they're really not paying attention. What if I ask this question? Why is Montreal the biggest city in Quebec? Oh, well, maybe it's because of its harbor or it's on the river or it was settlement or have patterns or its connections to other cities or whatever. It doesn't matter, really. What it does is it starts students thinking, and when they're thinking out loud, they're using language. So asking hypothetical questions, it encourages creativity to think of new solutions, not just the ones that the teacher already knows or the book already says. So here's one from one of the textbooks. It says, um, what is your dream job? What is your dream job? It's a great question. So I love this question because it's actually an if question if you break it down. Really what it's asking is saying, if you could have any job in the world, what job would that be, right? And so you have to think about it. And the great thing about it is it's not just hypothetical, but it's also personal. It's really asking students to think about themselves. They can't ask their partner, say, what's the largest city in Quebec, right? They're not asking uh, for an answer like that. They have to look into themselves and ask themselves what their dream job is. So this inspires creativity. They start thinking about what exactly they could do. Um, the third one of the seven is communication. So both in writing and in speaking, communication is about using language tools to understand what others say and to share your own ideas. Sometimes using things like persuasion to convince others. So you've got a great idea and you want to share it with someone else, but maybe you need to persuade them. The wonderful thing is, is we're used to doing these things in our first language in many cases, but sometimes in our second language, we need a little proddering or a push, things like that. Where do you want to go for dinner? Oh, I want to go out for pizza. Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, yes. And then you convince the other person why that's such a great idea. It's common. All right, let's, uh, let's go on. How do we teach communication? Um, well, we have to set up tasks in which students need to use a wide range of communication tools to build their strategies and skills. So creating a task in which they have to communicate. Students learn language and employability skills at the same time. So if we have a question about jobs, something to do with the workplace, and uh, the students need to solve a problem, then they're have, going to have to communicate to do that. A classic example is role-playing, role-playing. And um, in this case, when we role-play, what are we doing? Uh, this says, role-play is a network event in your classroom. Uh, learn as much as you can about each person you network with. Use these directions as a guide. Take notes. Okay, a few good things here. So this is this is in a, a, a unit about the workplace, and everyone's pretending to have a very particular job, and then you're interviewing them in their role in their job roles and trying to find out in order to network. Uh, it, a good thing about the task is it says use these directions as a guide so it supports the students and that support is essential but also I love this idea of take notes take notes so what are you doing here the task is forcing the students to uh, to uh, to listen uh, to someone else to ask questions so we're speaking listening and then they're writing so they're putting all the three and then of course afterwards they're going to read as well so reading writing listening and speaking they're going through all the skills in a task like this their communication skills so good for that in all of these cases, we always want to try to create flexible groupings, create opportunities and tasks for students to work on their own. Uh, they can work in pairs, they can work in groups, and they can work with the whole class. So find ways for students to use written and spoken uh, communication skills. And I've got a picture here of somebody texting. And I, I, you know, I, I know that as teachers, most of us hate students texting. In the, uh, but if we give them a task in which they have to text, 
maybe even within a class time or class hour, say, okay, I want you all to do the networking task, but only texting, right? And then let them do that and say, okay, save your texts and share them with me. I'll look through them afterwards and such. And, or you look through them and tell me, you know, what are the most common questions or, you know, what did you misunderstand? Great teaching opportunity. So again, embrace technology and use it to your advantage in the classroom. Collaboration, number four. Uh, there's two terms that are often confused. One is cooperation and the other one is collaboration. Now they're quite different. Cooperation is about dividing up a task among group members. So these uh, two guys here, they look like they're painting something. And in cooperation, we say, okay, you go paint the kitchen, I'm going to paint the uh, living room. And uh, they would be dividing up the task in order to get the house painted. But they're not really collaborating. Collaborating is working together on one problem. You say, oh, I think the ladder's too high. It's going to fall down. Uh, the other guy says, okay, well, I'll hold the ladder uh, while you go up. They're working together, right? And in collaboration, it creates more language opportunities. If the other person is in the kitchen painting, you're not going to talk to them, right? It's the same with the tasks that we give students. So examine those tasks that you give students. If they can be done individually, they're less likely to promote language use. Instead, look for tasks which students can only complete together through discussion in some case. Okay, so collaborative activities also promote scaffolded learning. What do we mean scaffolded learning? Um, I was giving a talk in Korea uh, a few years ago and I showed a picture of an animal up on the uh, screen and I asked, uh, uh, I was asking them to do some other tasks, but they noticed the animal and the three of them were three professors at the front were talking, older guys, old friends as well. And they say, oh, oh, it's a deer. And the other one said, oh, it's not a deer, you idiot, it's an elk. And uh, the third one said, oh, you're both idiots. He said, it's not a deer, it's not an elk, it's a moose. And the first one said, what's the difference between a deer and a moose? And he said, well, the deer has, uh, the deer has um, pointy horns. And uh, the other one said, the second one said, no, they're not horns, they're antlers, antlers. Say, so, okay, okay, uh, pointy horns, antlers for the uh, deer, but the moose has flat antlers, right? So, okay, so what were they doing? Well, a wonderful thing, actually, in terms of a, as a language teacher, they were doing scaffolded learning. They were challenging each other and building on what they knew. And even though it wasn't the task, they encountered so much vocabulary. Deer, elk, horn, antler, moose. So many, so many words, flat, pointed. So many, vo so many words, so much vocabulary coming out of it. So we want to create tasks and use tasks that promote scaffolded learning. So again, students need reasons to collaborate. So effective networking, and this is what it says in the little uh, uh, takeaway here uh, on the page, effective networking is not just about making connections. You need to con continue connecting with your contacts over time to build a strong and supportive network. Make a list, and this is what they have to do, make a list of five to eight ways to strengthen relationships within your network. Use ideas from the course and any others that you know. So, okay, so we're giving them a clear task. What I love about this one is, again, it's forcing students to work together. Why? Because they have to share ideas, and then they sometimes need to narrow those ideas down. What are the best five, or what are the best eight uh, ones? It forces them to t discuss and, and to be use a number of other skills, such as being, you know, examining and, and, and analytical skills to come up with an idea, maybe synthesizing, putting some ideas ideas together as well. It's all good. So they might say something like this. How about learning everyone's birthdays, right? What? And how would that help networking, somebody else would say. And then the person has to explain, say, well, if we know something about each person, maybe we'll find out what we have in common. Also, we can be nicer to them on their birthdays. Maybe two people have the same birthday and they'll feel a better bonding or something, so, and so on and so forth. So, so those sorts of ideas happen. The fifth, uh, the fifth of the seven points is self-management. Self-management begins with setting goals and then finding ways to reach them. 
So along the way, it's important for students to manage their emotions, their behavior, and their effort. They also need to organize their time and their work environments. Uh, just basically being organized about everything, but looking to yourself also, your emotions, behavior, and effort. It means that you can't just say, no, I feel, I, I, I don't wanna do this, or I don't feel like doing it, or you know, I'm in a bad mood today, I can't do this, or behave badly to someone else impolitely or something. They have to do it because they realize they're in a work environment and it's not acceptable. There's uh, for goal setting itself, uh, these are the SMART goals. It's an old idea, but one that's useful. Uh, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. So say a student says, I would like to be an astronaut. Well, that's great. That's very specific. How will you measure that? Well, becoming an astronaut would be far away. <laughs> you know, it takes years and years to do that. So maybe is it achievable? Um, well, you have to sort of decide. Um, you have to think, well, it is achievable, but is it realistic? Um, maybe it's realistic as well, that's fine. Is it timely? And that's where you might fall down. You might say, well, listen, becoming an astronaut, it's a great long-term goal, but how about some medium-term and short-term goals as well? So a short-term goal might be, why don't you study astronomy this year and learn more about the sky and stars and things like that? That would be useful for an astronaut. Um, as students consider their employment goals, they begin to realize how English will help to get them there. You say, if you're going to become an astronaut, what do you want to do? How are you going to do that? Okay, so how do we teach self-management? Well, there's sub-skills to self-management, and we talked a little bit about those uh, just in organizing yourself, but things like planning, uh, organization, persistence, not giving up, uh, progress monitoring, looking at how well you're doing, control, controlling yourself, controlling you know, your work environment, and attention to detail. All of these things, again, have language components to them. So they're very, very strong in terms of uh, doing things like, for example, number four, progress monitoring. That's keeping a diary, keeping a diary or keeping some sort of a chart, ticking off you know, what you have done. Persistence, keeping a calendar, seeing that you've done things. Planning, also in a calendar. So these are all good language skills. Speak Out, uh, one of the textbooks we mentioned, has a very interesting resource that I haven't seen anywhere else, and that is the mediation skills. So now, most textbooks don't deal well with conflict. You know, it's like, you know, how are you, Sally? I'm fine, Tom. Would you like to go to the beach? Yes, let's go to the beach. You know, it's, it's like very simple dialogue that doesn't have any conflict uh, in it. It's not like Mary says, no, I'd never go to the beach with you, you know, because you were mean to my friend. <laughs> you know, what? You would never find that in a textbook. But in fact, you find conflict in the workplace all the time. So students need the skills to deal with conflict. Conflict. And that's partly what this particular unit does. So I think that's uh, very admirable and it's a very important thing. <clears throat> um, earlier early in one of the examples, uh, there was this page and I found this very interesting as well. Six interview mistakes that can prevent you from getting hired. I find this interesting because as a textbook writer, the temptation is to write all the things you should do, you should do. So this one, first one is not shaking hands properly, then not telling the truth on your resume or CV, uh, using an email address that's not professional. So lots of ideas there. You could put those all into the positive, say, remember to do this, check, 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 check. But by doing these negatively, it really makes the students think much more. Also, they're having to rate them and they're doing it in groups. So again, it's a language thing. Oh, I think number three, you know, the third one is, should be number one, you know, say, oh, well, no. And then people are discussing and arguing. And again, I don't care what they say. What I care about is they're using language to complete a task. So again, these employability skills and language skills are coming together. So that's important. The sixth one of the seven is leadership. Work environments increasingly feature small teams. If you go to any uh, office now, you're gonna be on a team. And leadership is a necessary skill. It's shifting all the time. It's not just like you're hired to be the leader. It might be say, oh, we need a new group to deal with. Uh, you do this, you, know, you be the leader, okay, you're in charge. And different people have opportunities to show some leadership. What skills are important for leaders? Uh, there's a number of them. One is challenging assumptions. So you look at uh, just like the maze that I mentioned earlier, say, well, we don't, we can challenge how we 
deal with the problem. Maybe we just need a ladder or something like that. Having a vision and seeing the possibilities, you know, we just need to get above somehow. Uh, respecting and acknowledging contributors. That's just being kind to your teammates and saying, oh, good job, you did well. I understand what you did, thank you for that. Empowering followers to complete high quality work. Say, okay, I'm gonna give you this job. Do you think you can do it? Okay, go for it. And then being accountable when you make mistakes and mentoring the next generation or the next person who wants to be a leader, you're helping them out in some ways. How do we teach that leadership? We need to give students opportunities to experience leadership by presenting them with problem-solving tasks and letting them discover ways to solve them. So this was one that was actually, I have to say, was very new to me uh, lead on leadership styles. And students have already, in this unit, they've already talked about in a workplace or in their own personal lives or social situations uh, at, or at school where they've had a leader of some kind and described their good and bad points. And then they're introducing new language here, autocratic, participative, uh, delegative, transformational, transactional. So uh, they're all different. I had to read the definitions to understand what they meant, but that's great. So because it's a learning gap that you fill. And if it's a learning gap for me, I know it would be for my students. So great opportunity there. And again, students are discussing it. So they're going to do, uh, they're going to figure out things and improve their language as they do so. The seventh and final one is social responsibility. So students are usually ethical, uh, mostly ethical, uh, but they need to consider ethics in the employment context. It can be a little challenging. They learn to be more sensitive about social, cultural, public, and environmental issues. Uh, at least they have to show something, and particularly they have to show in alignment with the company that's hiring them. So if you have a company that uh, has very strong ethical values around some cultural or public issue, then you need to adopt those as well. So how do we teach that though? How do we teach students that? Well, we have to expose students to different issues and asking them to debate them helps to teach social responsibility. It also gives them content and language for daily conversations on social issues. Uh, a good way to do this is through case studies, which the, the books provide. Uh, in this particular one, uh, it forces learners to ask, what would I do? Just to summarize this one, uh, she's working at a company that's going to merge with another company, but many employees are going to lose their jobs. If they're losing their job, one of the persons who might lose their jobs is her best friend, who works at the company. But she shouldn't tell because she only knows this because she's in a special group. So what does she do? Does she tell her friend? Does she not tell her friend? It forces the students to think about ethical issues and make decisions in some way. Okay, uh, so the changing roles of learning materials. So we've seen that you know jobs are changing. We've seen they need new employability and language skills. What about the materials? Well, the materials have adapted uh, or are adapting. So these are skills specifically for employability and step up. And it's because the marketplace is competitive, it's getting more and more difficult to find a job. So it's a self-study course or in combination with a teacher-led class. So you have two ways of delivering it. And this is really to address the needs of uh, people who are already working or at home with families that need to attend school and maybe want to do some things on their own. It's got the usual reading, writing, listening, and speaking skills, vocabulary, but also note-taking, which we've already talked about a couple of times, pronunciation practice, and discussion strategies, all important. Lots of online resources for this one, including an ebook uh, that students can use and speak out uh, another title uh, digital lifestyle content and a variety of accents this is important uh, because you know we go out into the world and we don't just encounter people with British accents or American accents or Canadian accents they've got a variety and we need to be able to listen and interpret those uh, reading writing listening and speaking again but also workplace preparation Confidence, confidence in communication strategies. Uh, that strategies word coming up, uh, so important. And tasks using real world language. And it's British or American English. Two versions available, right? Tons of resources on there. And I've already mentioned the mediation bank. 
Uh, Speak Out has uh, uh, something unusual. Unlike some other series, the videos are both authentic, are both authentic and fully integrated into the teaching and learning. So authentic, voc it just means that they're listening to real language, not something that's recorded to be slower and easier with smaller vocabulary for language learning students. They're still comprehensible, but it 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 forces them to adopt strategies to better understand things. Uh, the tasks go through uh, vocabulary speaking, reading, listening, grammar, of course, is still important, speaking and writing throughout the unit continues. Okay, so we've got lots of differences, but how do we teach them? So what are some new ways of teaching and learning? Well, you know, we start with the old model, face-to-face -face learning. This is from 1847 in China, um, but it doesn't look really different from a class, many classrooms today. It's affordable. Uh, it, there's many advantages. It's affordable, accepted by all. We are used to this, uh, and it can be implemented anywhere. And there's disadvantages at the same time. There's limited resources, uh, time, and spaces. Uh, it relies on the same place at the same time. So all the students have to be there at the same time as the teacher. Uh, the students don't always have access. Uh, the teacher expertise may be limited. So the teacher is working with what uh, he or she has. And in this one, I'm so you know, full of admiration. There's no school, right? there's no classroom, there's no walls, there's no seats, there's no chairs. I don't, I doubt the students have books, but somehow with a blackboard, this teacher is, you know, putting out her heart onto the page and helping the students to learn. And that happens world, the world over. Something that's not so new model is online classrooms. And when I was researching this, I was kind of surprised to learn that it started in 1984 at the University of Toronto, not far from me, in a city in which I lived and met my wife. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been around for quite a while now. Um, online advantages, there's good reach with less travel time for teachers and students. Again, we're all doing it right now, this online learning. Uh, students can be international, as we are all around the world today. Uh, every class can be recorded, as this one will be, available uh, later on. And class resources can be made available outside of school hours. So again, you know, the video, you could look at this anytime. Online disadvantages, the technolo technology has, can be unreliable. And of course, all of us are always afraid. Like, oh, what if the power cuts out? Um, I was thinking about this yesterday. There was a big thunderstorm. And I thought, oh, you know, if it's, if it's stormy today, then, you know, will the electricity cut out? Uh, so the students can also become disengaged because they feel like they're just watching TV. They're not as engaged as much as if they were in a room with a live person. It's a challenge. Nothing's perfect. Hybrid classrooms or blended learning are really about uh, student uh, teachers using a combination, a combination of online and face-to-face. -face. So the really the teacher has to teach really two parallel classes one to the students right in front of them and the second one to students who are at home watching students outside the classroom should not be having a lesser learning experience so that's one of the challenges of this now uh, in montreal during COVID, uh, we had a lot of this going on where they would take half the students in the morning and the rest would watch online and then the other half of the students would come in the afternoon the other ones would watch online. It was a way of reducing the, uh, uh, you know, exposure to so many students at the same time. So it seemed to work. Uh, there's many advantages. Again, broader reach, uh, and the students who are unable to attend classes are not punished. And these are used in a few very curious cases. It's when when kids are sick or when they're in a hospital or can't come to class for some reason then uh, or remote too remote too far away from a school to come so it again creates opportunities for learning that otherwise would not be there there's disadvantages it's difficult to ensure the same tasks and the degree of interactivity for all for the in class students and the ones at home if i say get into groups in the classroom that's easy online, maybe I put them into rooms where they discuss with each other, but it's, it's not quite the same level. Some students may opt for online learning if they think it's less demanding, they say that. There's surveys done, they say, oh yeah, I like to do it because it's easier than, you know, and that I can, I can lay in bed when I watch my classes or something like that. Maybe, maybe that's a good thing, maybe not. <laughs> and there's larger demands on the teacher time. There's more preparation if you're trying to do two at the same time. Um, 
And uh, finally, there's tribred classes. And these are, these are something new that I just learned a couple of years ago, but uh, there is face-to-face, -face, there's online, but then on demand for students who want or need to take the class later. So you have, you know, yes, you're doing your face-to-face -face class, but you also have people watching online. But then, then, you know, somebody says, I can't watch it this week, I'm working, so I'll watch it next week and uh, or maybe a year from now right so how do we create classes that are also engaging and interactive for somebody watching at a later time there are some tricks there are some strategies we can use uh, we can say things like this um, and for those of you watching later stop the video now and answer these three questions right so you can give the questions and hopefully the student watching it later will stop and write their answers and then come back onto the video again uh, I don't, whether they do or not, it's up to them. But are the teachers supported is a big question. Like, as teachers, are we getting enough support from our, our schools to do this? Well, there's big advantages. And again, from the employability uh, point of view, it means people who are already working can be taking the classes in their own time. So if they have a full-time job, but they're trying to improve their language skills, their employability skills, they can learn on the weekends or late in the evenings or any time that best suits them. So it has the broadest reach of all of the methods. And it's the most convenience for students because they have the most choices, attend in person, attend online, or attend later on. Uh, the disadvantages, overworked teachers. So we work pretty hard as teachers. And you know this is just adding more work for teachers to conduct classes like this more students you can suddenly have 500 students and a thousand students it means less individual attention whereas if you have a classroom with 20 or 30 students in it you know they're getting you know 1 20th or 1 30th of your time and attention teachers are not always compensated uh, per student especially if a course is used later on uh, in montreal at concordia university there was a student who went online and uh, was taking an art history course, fantastic course, wonderful prof professor, great lectures, went to ask the teacher some questions and couldn't find them. Finally found that the teacher had died two years before, but the university was still using their videos for the course. In fact, the family of the people didn't mind, but uh, uh, of, the, of the professor didn't mind. They were kind of, you know, pleased that his work was continuing, but it was, it was an odd sensation. And of course, the university was saving money by not employing a teacher for this course. So it's questionable. And the last one in cyberspace, no one knows uh, you're a dog. <laughs> this is an old expression. It's basically when you're teaching um, something online, you don't know if the people listening are, are real or paying attention or engaged whatsoever. They could be dogs, you know, just watching your video. Okay, um, one of the things that makes all of this much easier is a new Pearson product called Pearson English Connect. So making uh, online options easier is really what it's all about. So it does this in a, quite a number of ways. It's got identical views for teachers and for learners, for assigning activities and for giving real-time feedback. It also uh, allows you to monitor the learner's progress and performance in gradebook. So as they complete a task, bang, it goes into your gradebook. You can see what they've done. You can, uh, you can say, you know, you can give them more advice about what they've done. And again, give some of that feedback. And it replaces older digital platforms. So it just does away with the Pearson English Portal and the My English Lab. So it's much more concentrated, much more concentrated, one-stop shopping, we would say. So it's a good thing. And it just helps with all of these online options. Okay, so what's next? What's next? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've had so many changes again since my grandfather's day, and uh, these changes continue. Uh, I think what we can expect is the unexpected. I talked very briefly about the Industrial Revolution in 1760. You know, it, it, changed, uh, it changed the world by creating factories, really, was one of the big parts of it. But it also, it also led to uh, reorganizing the school system to produce factory workers. So that's why a factory floor and a schoolroom look so similar in some ways. 
1961, factory robots introduced and now becoming more and more popular. 1981, personal computers, I mentioned that earlier. Mobile phones came around, 1983. 1997, the first phone app, and now everybody has an app. There's apps for everything and everybody has dozens on their own phones uh, for all sorts of educational and recreational and social means. Um, 2019, COVID-19 changed the world in terms of sending a billion students out of the classroom and into online learning. Uh, more than a billion students. Amazing. I think 1.3 billion at one point. So amazing. Just one, one little germ making, uh, one little virus making such a change to the rest of the world. And uh, many of those changes endure. And uh, 2022, ChatGPT and other AI programs. And I really encourage you to listen to tomorrow's webinar, which is going to be about uh, AI in education. It's going to be a good one. Okay, so what can you do? What can we do about all of this? Well, we have to reflect. Teaching is a reflective process. You reflect on why you teach the way that you do. Uh, question everything. Question everything. Uh, write your teaching biography, identifying the things that you do best and the things that you could improve. This teaching biography idea is just to look through, say, what are all my skills? You know, what am I really good at and where could I improve? I spend a lot of time, my PhD was in computer-assisted language learning, so I still work a lot with computers, but I'm having to learn new things about artificial intelligence right now, and I'm spending time to do that. Never stop learning. It's one of the slogans for uh, Pearson, and it's one that I truly believe in. It's the most important thing we can do. As teachers, we should never stop learning. All right. Okay, so what do we know after all that? Whew, a lot of information in a short time. First of all, employment opportunities are rapidly changing. Uh, secondly, uh, future, job require, future jobs require new employability, thinking, and social skills. So we have to be aware of those and look at the jobs that are coming up and adapt uh, to them in our classrooms to benefit our students. Learning materials are becoming more digital and delivery options more flexible. Again, we have to be uh, more flexible as well and acquaint ourselves. We have to embrace new ways of teaching and learning. Otherwise, we could be left behind. So embrace them now, try to learn as much about them as possible and engage. And everybody here is doing that. You're all attending these webinars. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for being involved in improving your professional practice. And finally, prepare for the unexpected. So just continue to improve your skills uh, doing that. Okay, so again, my name is uh, Dr. Ken Beatty. Uh, here's my email, kenbeatty at mac.com. If you have any questions at all about anything that we've said today, please call me. I'd love to hear from you.